Isaiah 53, we are wrapping up the Tried and True series, and today is part 5. And as you open to Isaiah 53, we are looking today at the theme of knowing Jesus. Hopefully you've heard that theme through the music, through the worship, through the scripture reading. Because that's where we're going today. You know, our church is all about Jesus. We don't need to get off track from what the Bible and what the Father have told us the Christian life is all about, and that is Jesus. Many people think and confess to know Jesus, but they really don't understand what knowing Jesus is all about. If you just have conversations with people on a normal, daily basis about what their perceptions are of what it means to know Jesus, you'll come up with a lot of different ideas. One of the things I hear a lot of times from people is that Jesus is the man upstairs. Have you heard that before? To distinguish Him from God the Father, who is the old man upstairs. Now, what do you think that means when people call Jesus the man upstairs? To me, that screams Jesus is irrelevant. That screams to me that Jesus and His miracle days are over. The parting of the Red Sea, the delivering of people from the mouth of lions and fiery furnaces. It's gone. It's done with. God has no strength anymore. He isn't able to do anything in this world anymore. He's just the man upstairs. I think that's the perception a lot of people have when they talk about the Jesus they know. The other one I hear often, very similar, is He's a great judge in the sky. When I get to the great judge in the sky, you'll see my faith on that day. Well, what do you think that means? I think, A, that means to most people that God can't wait to send everyone to hell because He's the great judge in the sky, if it's said in a negative context. Or, people have such a great view of themselves, they think they are so good that God's going to quit them on the day of judgment because they have such a nice smile and they've done so many good deeds. So he's the great judge in the sky. To some people, when you ask them about what it means to know Jesus, they will immediately whip out the necklace that they wear with the crucifix of Jesus. Or today, usually more frequently, they might roll their sleeve up to show you the cross. People today, when you ask them what they know about Jesus, they may say, we know Him in a Christmas and Easter kind of way. Others have a very good opinion of Jesus. They talk about Him as a God of love, of compassion, of diversity. Others, when they speak of Jesus, they may talk about, I know Jesus because of an event that happened a long time ago in my life. I made a decision for Jesus. Or I joined a church or something like this. There's been a lot of ideas of what it means to know Jesus. Let me share with you a few different historical ideas. The French philosopher and writer, Ernest Renan, he said, Jesus was the greatest religious genius that has ever lived. I think that's what America says about Jesus. Most Americans think Jesus was great, he was good, he was a genius, he was powerful, so on and so forth. And they leave him right in that category, kind of like Jesus is a Hollywood star or something to that effect. I think of Mikhail Gorbachev. Most of you might remember that name if you've been around a while. He said Jesus was the first socialist, the first to seek a better life for mankind. And that's kind of interesting, isn't it? He's using his political agenda to push Jesus in his realm of politics. I've heard a lot of people say the same thing from some of the major parties in America today. I think of Adolf Hitler. You know what Adolf Hitler said about Jesus? Listen to this. He said, in boundless love as a Christian and as a man... I read through the passage of the Bible which tells us how the Lord at last rose in His might and He seized the scourge to drive out the temple, the brood of vipers, and the adders. How terrible was Jesus' fight for the world. Can you see how Hitler used Jesus and used that statement to do what he wanted to do? Because surely when he fought the world, he was fighting for Jesus. You see, people know Jesus in their own way, but knowing Jesus in your own way is not knowing Him God's way. There is a big difference between the two. I think of probably one of the leading influencers of our generation, Oprah Winfrey. Some of you have seen the clip on YouTube. Some of you might have watched it when it happened. Where she said there couldn't possibly be just one way to heaven. And I think that her view expresses the pluralism of our society today. Well, a lady in the audience who had, you know, fire under her chair, she couldn't stay silent, started yelling out, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? And Oprah said, what about Jesus? Does God care about your heart? Or does God care about if you call His Son Jesus? 
you know, that's the idea of this world, isn't it? You know, just as long as we're all good and our hearts are smiley, everything's going to be okay. Because there's, in some way, shape, or form, you know Jesus. My friends, we've been studying Isaiah 52 and 53 the last few weeks. And the theme of this prophecy, of this gospel, of this future confession is knowing Jesus. And it's not knowing a Jesus or a Jesus someone has created. It is knowing the real, true Jesus Christ. We have seen that over and over again. Now this is a prophecy because Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before they came to pass. But it's not just a prophecy, it's a gospel. Because it's like these words were written at the foot of Golgotha. So detailed and specific as to what Jesus would endure. But yet it is also a future confession, because these are the words in the last days the Jewish people will make when Jesus returns again. They will say, we missed him the first time, but this time we got him. This time we know who he is. And by the way, if you are a Christian, a true Christian who has been changed in the heart by the real Jesus, this is your confession today as well. This is my confession. This is the church's confession. And in verses 11 and 12, God answers the confession that has been made so far. You see, Israel's been speaking. You've been speaking. I've been speaking in verses 1 through 11. But now in the second half of 11 and 12, God answers it with a commentary. How many of you would love to be answered by God? For God to just directly speak to you. Well, He is in this passage. And He here is answering the question, did we get it right? Did we get Jesus right? Have we created our own Jesus, or is this the real Jesus? Do we see Jesus the way God sees Jesus? Verses 1 through 11 was our confession, and now God is going to tell us what He thinks of our confession. So since it's the last time we're together in Isaiah 53, maybe for a long while, I want to start at verse 1 and read the whole thing. Join me, if you will, in your Bibles. And then we'll pray and ask for God's help as we consider this truth. This is Israel speaking, you speaking, me speaking, looking back to the cross. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, for Jesus, will grow up before God as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He, Jesus, has no form or comeliness. When we saw him, there was no beauty that we would desire him. Jesus was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. So we're saying, look, when Jesus was here, no one wanted Him. We looked at Him and He was from a poor family. He was virgin born. He was from ignorant Galilee. But then verse 4 starts to tell us why He came. Surely He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. We esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by Jesus' stripes we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. But the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He would not open His mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? Jesus was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, Jesus was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in Jesus' mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, Jesus will see his seed. He will prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in Jesus' hand. He will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. That's our confession. Now God responds to it. He tells us who the true Jesus is. He answers us today. God says, By His knowledge, by the knowledge of Jesus, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul into death. Because he was numbered with the transgressors. Because he bore the sin of many. 
and He made intercession for the transgressors. Let us pray. Our God, we need Your help today to understand Your Word. We need Your help today because so many of us think we know Jesus, but we don't even know what it means to know Him. Lord, we haven't experienced the depth, the wonder, the awe, the amazement, the transformation of knowing Your Son, Jesus. So today, God, I pray we would be calm, that we would be quiet, that our hearts would be opened by the power of Your Spirit. And today, we would understand Your response to this confession. And God, we would leave here knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, living for Jesus, only because of Your powerful grace and Your powerful work on the cross. And we'll give you praise and glory for all life change in Jesus' wonderful name. And God's people said, God answers this confession. And He says, By His knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. All of a sudden, God stopped the confession to make it clear that they got it. They understood who the real Jesus was. The real Jesus is not about a historical figure only. It is about the cross and what Christ accomplished at the cross. So he says, listen, by his knowledge. Now most translators render this a little differently. By the knowledge of him, the righteous one, my servant will justify many. Do you want to know how to experience the power of Jesus? Do you want to know how to obtain the benefit of what Jesus did in Isaiah 53? God says, look no further than right here. It is by knowing Him. Now, it's kind of interesting. The book of Isaiah began with a warning against God's people for not knowing. For not knowing. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13 said, My people will go into exile for a lack of knowledge. Man is humbled, each one is brought low. The eyes of the haughty are brought low because they don't know Him. Can I make a statement today? that I think is a cultural statement, but it's a true statement. Many people think they've got the Jesus thing down, but the fact is many people have never been presented with the true Jesus. In Escambia County, Florida, in the Bible Belt, there are thousands of people who live their lives as normal, who have went to church at some point, or maybe even go to church on somewhat of a regular basis, but they have not been confronted with a knowledge of the true Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to bash other churches or talk down about other Christians because I'm talking about people who are playing the game of Jesus and have not received the power of Jesus. They know about Him. They can recite bare historical facts about Jesus. They can tell you about church architecture. They can maybe even tell you about their grandmother's faith, but they are clueless about the real Jesus because they have not been confronted with the knowledge of the real Jesus. And you know what? Paul said the very same thing in Romans 10. He said, How will they call on Him on whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him if they've never heard of Him? And how are they to hear without some preaching? In other words, it is our responsibility to make sure everybody knows it's all about Jesus and we better get Jesus right. Look, there's a lot of things that we can get wrong and it's no big deal. And we're going to get things wrong. But if we need to get something right, it needs to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, we can feed thousands of people, and I praise God that last year this church did feed thousands of people. We can do wonderful works for our community. We can do outreaches everywhere. But at the end of the day, if we don't get Jesus right, we've got nothing right. By knowing Jesus, many will be justified. Knowing means becoming fully acquainted with the real Jesus, with His person, with His plan of salvation. It is knowing who He is and what He has done. This is more than mere speculative acquaintance. This is more than just speculating about the character of God. This is a child who knows their mother and their father and clings to them and trusts in them and listens to them because their parents are good. That's the kind of knowledge we're talking about here. I like how J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, has helped us to distinguish between intellectually knowing Jesus and really knowing Jesus. 
Here's the test today. If you want to check your heart, whether you just intellectually know Jesus or whether you've been transformed by Jesus. This is what he says. He says, how can we turn our knowledge about God into the knowledge of God? Turn your knowledge about God into the knowledge of God. He says the rule for doing this is simple, but it is demanding. It is that we turn each truth that we learn about God into a matter for meditation before God, leading to prayer and praise to God. Hear this again. Turn each truth that you learn intellectually about God into a matter of meditation for God. Leading to prayer and praise to God. In other words, if your brain knowledge does not lead to worship, it is worthless. If your intellect never travels down the pipe of your conscience and pierces your soul and changes your life, it is worthless. See, prayer and praise come from truly knowing Jesus. This is an experiential knowledge. This goes from intellect to worship, from head to heart, from life to eternity. It is not just facts. It is friendship, fellowship, forgiveness forever. Amen? That's what we're talking about here. Do you have friendship, fellowship, forgiveness, and do you know it will be forever? If you know that, you know Jesus. If you don't have that assurance, you need to check your heart this very morning. Paul's prayer in Philippians chapter 3 was that I may know Him, that I may know Jesus and the power of His resurrection. Jesus said, this is life eternal, John 17, that they may know Me and that they may know You, the only true God. They need to know Me. They need to know You, Father. C.S. Lewis has talked about knowing God, and he has said it this way. He said, if you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. And if you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get into the thing that has them. And there is only one source for all those things, and that is Jesus Christ. The church's call is Jesus Christ. The church's salvation is Jesus Christ. Your life being changed will only happen by surrendering it all, all that stuff that you're battling, all that heavy burden on your heart, surrendering it all to Jesus Christ. Now, Martin Luther, when he was talking about Christianity, he said knowing Jesus that Christianity is found in possessive pronouns. Because it's one thing to say Christ is a Savior. And if you go around and you talk to people, and you interviewed people in the street and said, who is Jesus? What does it mean to know Jesus? They would all probably say, Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. You hear that all the time. But it is quite another thing, Luther says, to say, He is my Savior and my Lord. The devil can say the first, the true Christian alone can say the second. So the question today is, do you know Him? Not did your family know Him. Not does the church know Him. Not does the culture know Him. Not are you good enough. Not do you have knowledge of Him. But do you experientially know Him? Do you know Him? By the way, as this wonderful statement continues, by His knowledge, by the knowledge of Him, my righteous servant will justify many. Right away, God says, Jesus is not just a man. Now, you'd already get that if you've studied with us verses 1 through 11. But he's making it clear he's not just a man. He is my righteous servant. Now, you probably read that and you hear the word righteous and you think church lingo. And that's unfortunate because we have misused, abused, neglected the word righteous so long it doesn't even strike us anymore. But you've got to understand, Romans chapter 3 tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. And Paul's quoting the Old Testament when he says that. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have turned aside. Together we have become worthless. There is no one that does good, not even one. Theologians call this total depravity. We are dead in our sins. We do the wrong thing. We choose the wrong way. We don't make friends with God on our own. We run from God and do it the hard way, ten out of ten times. There is none righteous, no, not one. And yet, 
God is saying, this servant that you've been studying with me the last five weeks, he is righteous. There's something different about him. He is pure and holy on his own. But I think that God is saying this about Jesus to make it clear. All the charges spoken against him, all the lies spread about him, all the evil things people say about Christ today, they are wrong. You know, I had the opportunity to finally watch the movie The Da Vinci Code. Years after that thing came out. I wouldn't watch it just because I refused to give anyone money for that movie when it came out. In fact, we spent weeks in our church, about three or four weeks on Sunday nights, refuting the errors of the book, The Da Vinci Code. But I finally got to watch the movie a few weeks ago because I was able to watch it for free. And as I watched that, I said, that screams... America 2013. We live in a day and age where people have just come to attack and lie about the person of Jesus Christ. And I think the biggest reason why is because the church has so misrepresented Jesus Christ. But God is saying something here. God is saying, no matter what other people have said about my son, no matter how they will slander my son, no matter how they will bring up conspiracy theories to make Jesus Christ look bad, the fact of the matter is, Jesus was not just man. Jesus Christ was perfect God. He was righteous to make you right with me. This was the early church's preaching. If you don't get this, if you think Jesus was just man, you don't get the gospel. Listen to the preaching of the New Testament. Acts chapter 3, Peter says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, He glorified His servant Jesus, but you denied the Holy and the Righteous One. He is the Righteous One. When we pray, we should pray, Jesus, you are the righteous one. I am not right. I can't do it on my own. That's why you came and I love you because of this. Because you are righteous. When Stephen was preaching before those rocks were stained with his blood in Acts chapter 7, he said, you stiff-necked people, you uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. They killed those who announced the coming of the righteous one. Why do you think people were so angry that the righteous one was coming? Because if he's righteous, what does that mean about me? I'm not righteous. If I need the righteous one, I'm not righteous. To surrender to Jesus is not just to say Jesus is a Savior. It is to surrender to Him as Lord. We believe in the Lordship of Jesus because the Bible teaches without it, you're not saved. And you can't believe in the Lordship of Jesus until you believe Jesus is righteous and you are not righteous. This is wonderful truth. Jesus is not just a good man, a moral leader. He is pure goodness and righteousness. It is His righteousness that makes us righteous. That is why the word justified comes right after this. In fact, in Hebrew, it says, the righteous one justifies. And the word righteous and the word justified come from the same root Hebrew word because they are tied together. What does it mean to be justified? It means to be acquitted from guilt, to declare somebody right, so their sins are pardoned as if they had never been committed. I like to define justification this way, to declare a guilty person as righteous. Have you ever gotten away with something before? You did something some years back, you did wrong, and somehow nobody saw you. They didn't check the fingerprints, you know what I mean? And you got away with it. Maybe you've been cheating the government your whole life. Maybe you've been cheating your boss. Maybe you cheated a friend. You stole something. You took something that wasn't yours. Recall your life for a minute and think about that. You never got away with it, so you think. You know, I want you to understand today that God is a just judge. And one day all those crimes and those sins, whether in our heart or with our actions that we have done, we will be called to count to them before God. And if no person on this earth saw it, God saw it. Do you believe that? God, if He didn't see it, He's not God. 
I guarantee you, he saw it. Now think about this word justify for a minute here. Jesus Christ, when He does His work on the cross, He, and by the way, this is what blows my mind about people that think they can lose their salvation, He took every crime you committed in heart and deed, and He took the punishment on Himself, so it was like you never did the crime. Amazing! And that is exactly the kind of forgiveness I want. I don't want to be forgiven and then it's brought up again six months later. I don't want to be forgiven and have to suffer with it the rest of my life. If I could make a social comment for a minute, I think part of America's problem is our criminal justice system. Because I deal with people every single day who are walking the streets of Pensacola, walking the streets of Escambia County, and because of something they did in the past, they can't get a job in the present. It is held against them the rest of their life. It's not that way with Jesus Christ. Amen? When He pardons you, it is gone. I want forgiveness that lasts forever. You know how it is when someone keeps holding on to the past. Why do friendships not last? Why do marriages not work? One of the biggest reasons is the past. Look, if you're in a relationship, you're dating, you're engaged, you're married, you've got to realize the past is the past. Because if you keep holding on to the past, you're never going to have a present and the future. And that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is not about living in the past. The gospel is about Jesus working in you in the present. And He will keep working on you until you get to heaven to be with Him forever. You've got to let it go. Let it all be go behind. And that's what Jesus does in justification. Romans 10 says it this way, We were ignorant of the righteousness of God. We tried to establish a righteousness of our own. We would not submit to God's righteousness. But Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You don't want the scales of good and bad works on the day of judgment. Oh, it hurts my heart when I talk to people who say they're Baptist or say they're a part of another Christian group. And when you ask them, why are you right with God? They say, because I'm a good person. It breaks my heart and it tells me we aren't preaching Jesus. We're preaching moralism way too often. If you're hearing that from people, they haven't been confronted with the work of Jesus on the cross. They may have heard about the cross. They may have heard about the resurrection, but they haven't heard about the work on the cross. And there is a difference between the work on the cross and the cross itself. Big difference. You see in Romans 3.20 it says there, By the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You want to be free from condemnation. You want to be free from death. And that is the point of Jesus' righteousness. It's as if He took His perfect righteous robe. And then He took off our filthy garments of sin. And He exchanged them with us. He puts His robe of righteousness on us. And God looks on us and doesn't see our sin anymore. He sees Jesus and His blood. And He says, that's my child. He's forgiven. I love Him. I'm going to keep Him forever. And He looks on Jesus at the cross and He bears all the sin and the filth and the judgment you and I deserve. And then Jesus takes it. And if you like football, He takes it for the long bomb and He throws it away and it is gone forevermore. Amen? That's what Jesus does on the cross. He gives us His righteousness and He takes our filth away. And God doesn't see it anymore. My righteous servant will justify many. That word many trips a lot of people up, but it's the truth. You see, just because Jesus, John 3.16, in this way loved the world, does not mean the world comes to Him. The sad news is many reject Him because of their depravity, because of their sin. When we get to heaven, we will be surprised to see some people there we never thought would be there. I think we will be surprised to not see some people there whom we assumed were going to get there. And here's the kicker of all. There will be a lot of folks that are going to be surprised to see you and me there. That's what the word many is telling us. Not everyone makes it to heaven. Look, God is good and we believe in the power of the cross, but we also believe that God only takes the cross and applies it to those who receive Him by faith. And He knew those people before the foundations of the world. Now how all that works out, the Bible calls that a mystery. It is a wonder. It is amazing. But the fact is, as God loves the world, He only redeems those who come to Him by faith and are saved. 
And He is the one who calls them by the power of His Spirit to come. Revelation 7 does tell us something wonderful about this though. Before you're getting bogged down and worried, the word that is used often for those people is the church, the branches, the elect, the sheep of Jesus. There's many different terms in the New Testament used to talk about the bride of Christ, the family of God, that the many that will be saved. And we need to be faithful with the gospel, love the gospel, love the lost as Jesus did, seek to save the lost as Jesus did. And if we do that, many will be saved. This tells me I don't have to worry about being a failure when I'm an evangelist. I just got to spread the news and let God handle it. Revelation 7 says God's going to handle it. You know what heaven looks like? John says, I saw a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from every tribe and people and language standing before the throne of God, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Look, the church is a beautiful church of all peoples and tribes and languages and colors, all one in Jesus Christ, the many. And I would again say, one of the most wonderful things is when a church physically looks like that. Because it shows that we know Jesus. And a church that does not have people of different ethnicities and tribes and tongues and nations limits the heart of God. And it limits the power of the gospel. Because the gospel transcends all that. So I pray you continue to pray with me that Klondike Baptist will not just look like Beulah, but Klondike Baptist will look like the entire city of Pensacola. Because that's the gospel. Justifying many from all tribes and tongues and peoples and nations. And the more we look like all of Pensacola, the more God gets the glory. Because God can do what laws can't do. He can change hearts and bring people together. That's the gospel. He will bear their iniquities. Not that he became a sinner or that sin was transferred. That's impossible. But he took the consequences, the guilt, the suffering of sin. It's like Jesus stood between the stroke of justice and the sinner. And he received the blow upon himself. He intercepted the judgment we deserved, freeing us from legalism and bondage. He bore our iniquities. So many Christians are trying to bear their iniquities. And let me tell you something. If you do, you're going to sink every time. You've got to turn it over to Jesus. Will Paller will, will give you no victory. Jesus will give you victory every single time. Verse 12, as we end this study. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many. He made intercession for the transgressors. God now declares what the result of all of this confession has been. God now declares why Jesus endured this and what it means for you and for me. The language here, it's the illusion of war, of victory after a a terrible conflict. And, And the soldiers are coming home. The leader is coming back home and distributing the spoils of war, the spoils of victory after a battle won over the enemy. And God says, I'm going to be the one dividing the spoils. The Father says, I'm going to divide the spoils. God was the spectator. God was the judge. God was the orchestrator. Jesus was the general who went out and fought and won the victory. When Jesus has driven the enemy out of the field, He will take the plunder. And it will be unquestionable victory as He distributes it to His people. My friends, you need to understand today, the cross is not about a possibility of victory. The cross means the mission has been accomplished. The victory has already happened. Sin, Satan, death, hell, the world, the flesh, all of our foes have been vanquished in the sight of God. We need to live again in the victory of the cross. Live in the power of the cross. Live in the knowledge of the cross. And I want to tell you, glory always follows suffering. Jesus suffered for the victory. Jesus didn't suffer the suffer. He suffered so we could have victory. So this church could be a place where people come and they find victory. Where people who are addicted to pornography find victory. When people who are addicted to pride find it's not all about them, it's about everyone else that God loves like them and God can 
and use them to find the greatest joy they've been searching for when they find out it's about Him and His people. It's about a church where people are set free from addictions, where people are set free from the bondage, when people have so much guilt they can't handle it anymore and they're set free, where people come and they're prayed over and they are healed by the power of Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus dividing His work to all of us because He loves us. Romans 8 says, The suffering of this present time is nothing to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed with us. He will divide it. The New King James says, With the great, many translations say the many, much more accurate. He will divide it with the many, the spoil. All that Jesus Christ has accomplished is available today. He is offering it today. We will die and we will go to heaven and spend eternity with Him. We will rule and reign with Him forever. We will rule and reign in the new heavens and new earth. We will enjoy all the wonderful things that God has made for those who love Him. Now, as a pastor, I've got to explain the next statement a little bit. Because a lot of you could read it and maybe get your heads puffed up real fast. It says, He will divide the spoil with the strong. A lot of us say, yeah, it's me. I'm one of the the stalwart members of Klondike Baptist Church. I'm the strong. My prayers are powerful. I want you to understand something. The New Testament is clear. We were weak. Jesus makes us strong. So it's not you. It's Jesus Christ in you. And if Jesus Christ ain't living through you, there is no strength in you. The Bible says over and over again that we are victorious in all things. We are conquerors through Him who loved us. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says it this way, Thanks be to God, who in Christ leads us in a triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. So after war, the victorious commander leads his army back home. They have the spoils of war behind them, the valuables that they won, the gold, the silver, the money, the articles they captured. Then the princes, the nobles, the generals, the people are following behind. Usually in the ancient days there would be a magnificent chariot leading the way, two white horses. And my friends, the fact is Jesus Christ has led the way of victory over Satan, over sin, over death, over hell, and over the grave. Hallelujah to His name. He has preserved the gospel pure in spite of all opposition. I want you to understand there is a battle going on right now against the true message of the gospel, against knowing the real Jesus, but Jesus Christ and the true gospel will win at the end of the day. It will win. Darkness will be defeated by the light. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then this passage ends, and we end today with a final review of the chapter God says, look, this is what it's all about. You want to know Jesus? You've got to know this. It's not just looking at a cross. It's not saying, I believe that Jesus died for me. It's understanding the cross so that it goes from your head to the heart. And these four things he lists here are the four things that summarize the work of the cross. And knowing the cross, not just knowing about the cross. Number one, I'm going to just do them real fast and we're done. Number one, he poured out his soul unto death. He poured out his soul unto death. Yesterday we had a bonfire going in the backyard. We cut a couple trees down. And you know, it took us like, I'm not kidding you, like four or five hours before the fire got going. And guess what I had to throw in the fire to get it going? Gasoline. I had to pour it on the fire. And I did pour it on the fire. I poured it out. And then I started taking cups, throwing cups onto it until the cup was what? It was empty. I mean, if you know anything about gasoline, you don't throw half the cup out, right? You can throw all the the gas out onto the fire, right? You empty it onto it. And I went through a gallon of gas yesterday. I emptied the can to cut and burn all these trees down in the backyard. I want you to understand something. When Jesus poured it out, this means He totally poured it out. There was nothing left. Nothing more He could give. Spurgeon says here, Jesus gave poor sinners everything. He poured it all out. 
His every faculty was laid out for them. To his last rag, he was stripped on the cross. No part of his body or of his soul was kept back from being made a sacrifice. The last drop was poured out till the cup of God's wrath was drained. He made no reserve. He kept nothing back, even his innermost self. He poured out his soul unto death. Learn from this. The cross is about Jesus giving his all so we can be totally forgiven. I don't want to be partially forgiven. I want it all gone. And Jesus Christ bore it all. All, By the way, that means He gets all the glory too, doesn't it? And that means He did all the work. It's not your good works. It's Jesus' work alone. Number two, He was numbered with the transgressors. His whole life He was numbered with sinners. I mean, think about it. What did they call Jesus? Sabbath breaker. They said He was a drunkard, a friend of publicans and sinners. At his death, does he have a stately place, a royal crown on his head? He gets a crown of thorns. He takes the place of a murderer, an insurrectionist, Barabbas. And then if you know the story of the cross, he's put between two thieves, two insurrectionists, one on either side. The middle spot reserved for the most guilty of all the criminals. From a visual standpoint of the cross, Jesus didn't look any different than any other common criminal, did he? There was no halo around Jesus' head like some of the pictures paint when He was on the cross. He didn't move off of that cross. He had no stately form or majesty. Nothing about His appearance made Him attractive. He looked like every other sufferer. No miracle went on externally on the cross. He took His place with and for sinners and the worst of sinners, murderers. What is the application of that? Why don't you think about this? We would be shocked if a godly woman from our church saw a list of prostitutes and said, put my name down among them. We'd be shocked, wouldn't we? We would be shocked if a godly man looked at a list of murderers and said, put my name in that list. I want to hang out with them and be a part of that group. But that is exactly what Jesus did for us. He had to die among the worst of sinners so He could forgive the chief of sinners. And by the way, the Apostle Paul wasn't the only chief of sinners. So are you. So am I. And until you understand the cross, you won't understand that you are the chief of sinners. Number three, he bore the sin of many. The Hebrew word here means to lift up, to carry away, to take away the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is important again because only God can forgive sin. Look, you can, you can forgive people. You can even forgive a wrong done unto you. The Supreme Court can't forgive sin though, can it? You read this. He bore the sins of many. We try to forget our sin. We try to change from sinning. We try to pretend like we never sinned in the first place. But the fact is, only Jesus can carry them away. He can only carry them away. Look, some of you in your seat and you're restless today. You're ready to go home, but stop and realize the reality of your sin. And realize you can run out these doors, but you can't run from your sin. But Jesus Christ can take them away forever. Forever. There's people that need to come forward after the service just to be prayed over, to have victory in their lives, to have their sins borne away forever. And then the last point, the last point, number four, that you've got to get the cross. Knowing Jesus is knowing He made intercession for us. The word intercession means to mediate, to go between, to stand between. Here's a little grammatical note. Every other time the verbs have been used here, they've been used in the perfect tense. That means they were a completed action. So if you go back three, he poured out himself to death. That was completed. He did it once. He was numbered with the transgressors. That's his death. He did it once. He bore the sin of many. He accomplished that on the cross, never to be repeated. Perfected. Acts. But his intercession in the Greek language is imperfect tense. Meaning he never stops Doing that. Merriam Webster has defined intercession as one who works with opposing sides in order to bring about an agreement. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he was doing the work of interceding. He cried out in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As he was suffering for you, he was pleading for you. When we suffer, we curse our enemy. When Jesus suffered, he pleaded for his enemy. The depth of the love of God to do this for you. 
He put himself between an angry God and sinners, received the blows in his body and in his soul, which otherwise would have been on you in hell forever. Romans 8.34, who's going to condemn you? Jesus Christ is the one who died, and he is at the right hand of God. He is either seating for you. He is able to save you to the uttermost because He always lives to make intercession for you. Look, if you want to know Jesus, you've got to know that He did this on the cross and He's doing that today at the right hand of God. I love the way one preacher said, he said, would you pray more powerfully if you knew Jesus was in the same room with you praying? He said, well, the fact is, distance makes no difference. Jesus is praying for you. And He is next to you. Even though He's at the throne of God, He is with you, interceding for you, keeping you, saving you to the other most. And this ends, He does this all again for the transgressors. Look, you can't know Jesus until you know you're a sinner. You can't know Jesus until you've been horror-struck by sin, by the dread of sin. It's until you know you're a sinner that you know you need a Savior and you know you need a Lord. You cannot approach God without this. So today, if you think you know Jesus, and today you've been encountered with the truth of the gospel and what Jesus really did, you as a transgressor need to run to Him. Run to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to do exactly what verse 12 says. I need you to take the death I deserve. I need you to take the sin I deserve. I need you to bear the sins away. I need you to make intercession because I can't go to God on my own. I can't get right on my own. And that's why you came. God, forgive me this day. A.B. Simpson has said, the gospel tells rebellious men that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that the judgment of the guilty has been revoked, that the condemnation of the sinner has been canceled, that the curse of the law has been blotted out, that the gates of hell has been closed, that the portals of heaven have been opened wide, that the power of sin has been subdued, that the guilty conscience has been healed, that the broken heart has been comforted, the sorrow and misery of the sin of the fall has been undone. If you don't know Jesus today, today you need to run to Him. Run to Him with all you have, with your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength. Run to Him and He will forgive you this day. And you will know Him, not just intellectually, but you will know Him. And you will stand here today a changed person by the power of the cross. Would you bow with me this morning? God, be merciful to us sinners. Be merciful this day. Oh God, we receive You. We love You. We know You and we are thankful for You. Lord, if there's any here today who You are calling to Yourself, I pray, God, they can do nothing but what Your Spirit says and that they would come and that they would be changed as they throw their hearts before you. For those of us who are Christians and take the gospel for granted, I pray today that we would live like we know Jesus. That we would love like we know Jesus. That we would be transformed like we know Jesus. Oh God, just work in our hearts, we pray. As you remove sin. As you remove condemnation. And we will give you the thanks, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.